all Barabbas. Don't you feel any guilt? Doesn't your conscience hurt? That's an innocent man that you stood against. That man, the Son of God, Jesus, passed back and forth from Herod to Pilate, Herod to Pilate. What are we going to do with him? I don't know, said Pilate. Barabbas, you even got away with murder. And that innocent man, thy will be done. Thy will be done, Lord. Barabbas, don't you struggle with something this day, even to this day? Haven't you heard the story of Jesus Christ? I've heard it. But do I need to give up something deep inside of me? Do I need to allow something to die away from me? Oh, Barabbas, that innocent man took your place because the leaders couldn't decide your innocence. And the crowd said, crucify him. Oh, Barabbas, is there a little of you in me? Thy will be done, Lord. Thy will be done. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 11 through 26. Jesus stood before the Roman governor who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. So you say, answered Jesus. But he said nothing in response to the accusations of the chief priests and elders. So Pilate said to him, don't you hear all these things they accuse you of? But Jesus refused to answer a single word, with the result that the governor was greatly surprised. At every Passover festival, the Roman governor was in the habit of setting free any one prisoner the crowd asked for. At that time, there was a well-known prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to set free? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus called the Messiah. He knew very well that the Jewish authorities had handed Jesus over to him because they were jealous. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Pilate to set Barabbas free and have Jesus put to death. But Pilate asked the crowd, which one of these two do you want me to set free for you? Barabbas, they answered. What then shall I do when Jesus called the Messiah, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they all answered. But Pilate asked, what crime has he committed? Then they started shouting at the top of their voices, crucify him. When Pilate saw that it was no use to go on, but that a riot might break out, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am not responsible for the death of this man. This is your doing. The whole crowd answered, let the responsibility for his death fall on us and on our children. Then Pilate set Barabbas free for them, and after he had Jesus whipped and handed him over to be crucified. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> You probably don't know me personally, no. but I bet you know about me. And I have been known to be kind of a a wild head. I've been known kind of to be a radical. I mean, you show me a system, and you can already tell I'm against it. But I didn't come here to tell you about my story so much as, as I came to ask a question. I came to ask a question that I hope you'll help me answer. Why, why did he choose? Why did they choose me over him? My name is Barabbas. I was the one that the crowd chose instead of Jesus to be set free. But my name also means son of the father, like a rabbi or a teacher. 
And how ironic is that? That my name is called Son of the Father, and yet the Nazarene declared that he was the Son of our Father God. But why? Why would they choose me over him? Why would they choose me over him? The Nazarene and I, we grew up together in Galilee. We love those old time religion of, of Moses and Elijah and, and David. And, and because we grew up in Galilee, we always believed that the only good Roman was a dead Roman. And our neighbors to the south of us, we couldn't understand that the Samaritans, they were always arguing some, some old time war about whether the temple should be in Jerusalem or should be in Bethel. When Jesus grew up and left Nazareth, I didn't see him that much after that. He uh, ended up taking up, I understood, with that desert hermit named John. And, and I took up with, with the Hill Country Gang. And we would, we would go around and create a little trouble. You know, nothing really bad this time. You know, nothing really bad at first. We'd, we'd kind of saw off the spokes of the Roman chariots. And a couple of times we broke into Pilate's compound in Caesarea and stole his horses. And, yeah, we would go through Judea and raid some of the towns. And the local yobos, they would try to catch us, but they were never successful. And I'm not even sure they really wanted to. Because we'd just go hide in the hills until everything cooled down. But then there was that one time. We had the idea that we would raid Herod's castle. In near the Dead Sea, his desert retreat. And, and so we got into the castle just fine, and, and all of a sudden one of the guards saw us, and, and one of our gang got spooked and, and knifed him. Most of us got away, but Herod's men, they tracked me down. And I was convicted of murder and resisting the government by force. And that's how I ended up on that day. Like I said, I don't know where Jesus went after after we grew up in Nazareth, but I heard that, that he began teaching and preaching about about the real meaning of the old covenant. And and uh, he would he would teach and preach about about the love of God and the coming of the kingdom. I also heard that he healed the people who were sick and, and and brought healing to those who felt broken. And, and one day, I heard him raise somebody from the dead in Bethany. Uh, I've heard those stories before, though. There's always some trumped-up person that pretending to be the Messiah. And it always happens that whenever they do that, they end up, they end up hanging on a cross. But Jesus was a preacher. And although he told our leaders that they were nothing better than whitewashed tombs and, and that the God, Lord Yahweh, is the true God and not Caesar. He wasn't a political person, but we had a lot of followers. Even people in the upper classes followed him. And, but I never, I never felt like he really knew who he was. I never felt like he was the kind of person someone would, would want to kill. I thought about myself and I I thought about people. And, and it occurs to me that that maybe I was chosen because maybe I was chosen because I was convenient. Because I didn't push anybody. I didn't challenge anybody. You know, if they, if they could choose me, then, then they could choose just everything they've known and all their comfort and convenience and everything they've always known and, and set a rebel free. And You know, why would they choose me? Maybe, maybe it's because I allowed them, I appealed to their sense of selfishness. That, you know, if they chose me, then they could continue living like they've always lived and, and live in fear and uncertainty and and suspicion and fantasy just to get everything they want and kind of hold themselves up in their own little circles and, and not have to worry about who they have to, to be sharing with, who they have to be generous with. Just keep it all for ourselves. They, maybe I chose them because I didn't challenge them. I was a 
convenient choice. Because the Nazarene was exactly opposite. He challenged people all the time. He challenged people to become followers of God. He, he told people that we need to repent. We need to change our behavior and our attitudes. He said that, that if you love God, you can't turn your back on your neighbor, whoever your neighbor is. And he said the rule of God is not something back, back in David and, and Solomon's time. The rule of God is not something way in the future that we hope to get to someday. He said the rule of God is here and now in Him. And that's where we can find peace and courage and forgiveness and Maybe, maybe start over. I, I, I can see why I was chosen. Because I made it easy. I made it convenient. I didn't challenge anybody. But I think about something else, too. Right? I wonder if I was chosen because... I wonder if, if I was chosen because... I didn't force us to look at our enemies. I mean, think about it. The people who chose me, they, they risked a lot to do that. You know, one day I, I might knife a Roman, but who knows, you know, I might knife one of my fellow Jews at the same time. They knew that I worshipped the God of power, and that's all that mattered to me. And, and then one day, whatever I did to a Roman, I might... Do the same to do. I mean, what do you do with a terrorist anyway? When you set him free, what's he going to do? Well, he'll probably go on a suicide mission somewhere or end up being a notch in some Roman sword or, or maybe one of his own people will do him in. <clears throat> yeah. Huh. But Jesus, he was different. <clears throat> Challenged them and challenges us. Not just the people then, but he challenges us. I mean, you think about how we like to look at our enemies. Our enemies, we like to think, are all outside of us. You know what? The Romans who are in control of our land and, and don't give us any peace, or, or Herod who takes all the money for himself and lines the pockets of, of those he cares for and his minions and his people. And I've seen our own people starving just to feed his table. And you know, by, by choosing me, then we can always think about the enemies outside of us. But, but the Nazarene challenged us to look at the enemy inside. Reminded us that there's still a little bit in each and every one of us that that chooses evil, even when we want to do good. That that becomes selfish or or self-serving or choose for the convenience over sacrifice, choose over serving ourselves rather than serving someone else. That there's an enemy inside of us that He called us to look at and to be aware of and to claim and to call out and to allow God with our open hands to take. Maybe that's why they chose him instead of Jesus. Because if they let Jesus go free, then he'd remind them. He'd remind them of this challenging call to live a, I don't know, what do you call it, a, a high bar life? Instead of settling and compromising. But I think he... They chose him because if he lived, then he would have challenged them to, to confront the enemy inside of us. And I think that's always the harder one to see. You know, I, I wonder sometimes. I wonder sometimes if we're not that different from the crowd. That we have a choice, too, of choosing for convenience or, or Christ or choosing for what's comfortable or what's sacrificial, what's, 
what's subservient or what's generous. We have that choice every day too. And I guess the question is, what's the choice we'll make? And what? What has to die in us? So Jesus becomes known. 